Hello everyone, welcome to our NZX Deep Insight webinar for this week. Um, we're very lucky to be looking at the red meat market, looking at the global market, and also looking at how, you know, really owning and, um, I mean, exploiting is a terrible word, but making the most of our, our reputation and our fantastic execution of how we produce in global markets will really benefit New Zealand. Um, we'll just start with the usual uh, brief going through how to use the system. So um, if you look on the slide below, you'll see that um, if you are having any problems with audio, we have got you on mute, but you should be able to hear. If you have any major problems, try all of the things that are listed there around checking your PC, your speakers are plugged in, and as a default, go to your phone. We find that that's often the most um, reliable source if you are having audio issues. Now, I'm going to hand you over to Hugh Good, who is, um, I've put him down as market global market intelligence, uh, but he does a whole lot of research and looks into what consumers are looking for, what their changing behaviours are, because we can't be amazing at producing if we don't understand what the consumers expect from us. So I'll hand you over to you, Hugh. Brilliant, thank you, Julia. Uh, let me just get uh, my presentation up and running. Just get the slides going, do the tech thing. Yep, great, can everyone see that? Yep, yep. we're going. Okay, so um, yeah, so thanks, Julia. I, I'm gonna take you through a little bit of work that we've been doing, um, primarily with a focus on China, uh, and then, but it, we've also been doing it more widely in some of our export markets, uh, key export markets. We started actually doing some social media monitoring in China uh, when COVID first happened um, back in, well, we started it in January. Um, and it certainly had a focus on China originally, because that's where we thought it might be focused, but obviously it's got a lot wider than that. But, uh, but it was interesting, some of the learnings from China, um, how they've had a lot of relevance to other markets that we export to um, and have relationships with, um, and, and the sort of how markets are following a relatively similar similar curve. I'll tell, talk a little bit about the, 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 the method and what we've done. So it's all secondary research. Um, it's all uh, social media monitoring from the channels that are open to us. Uh, in China, that's Weibo, QQ, um, and some, some other blog uh, and news sites. We don't have access to the, the WeChat, which is, um, they, they tend to lock down their data, but we have a lot of other streams that we can collect from. I mean, this first chart shows you the kind of, the, the, the the kind of data that we're looking at. I'm not going to bombard you with um, with with graphs, but um, when the when the virus first hit, you could see the, the volume of mentions on social media in China. Um, and on the right hand side is some of the sentiment. So it was overwhelmingly negative, as you as you might um, as you might not be surprised. But over time, the volume of negative comments um, declined, and probably people got sick of talking about it. So the overall volume declined, and then you have some sort of more positive. Um, comments around COVID or coronavirus as, as time goes on. Um, it, it's quite a, a powerful tool because you don't have to dictate what questions to ask. You just look at the data and then you, and you work out and you interrogate it like that. And it's, and it's pretty real time. So we were able to provide feedback to, to industry and to farmers about what was going on with a really quick turnaround, not having to do lots of complicated scripting and questionnaire design and sampling. It was it was pretty real time and pretty powerful for, for a situation that's um, evolving like COVID. I'll talk about some of the things that we saw originally in China, but I'm sure they have relevance if you're, if you're in some of the markets affected by COVID. So certainly we saw a lot more um, people preparing at home. We saw a lot more talk about convenience because food service was essentially shut down. So people um, demanding food that was easy to prepare at home. We saw a lot more experimentation as well. So people um, trying new things. Um, we saw, and, and outside of China, we saw things like lamb mints that people might not have used before really shoot up in terms of people talking about it and people purchasing. So um, it really um, it really shaped um, and changed people's behaviors because of this impact on, on, on lack of access to food service and needing to do lots of cooking at home. Um, we were able to see things like the importance of immunity and, 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 and for us, beef's role in, in supporting immunity, especially it's got a real role seasonally. So people will be, is it in Chinese traditional medicine, you have it around the second snow, you want to be starting to eat beef to, to boost your immunity. But we saw that um, across the board, having more conversation volume and more discussions about how to support people's immunity 
um, as COVID was um, playing havoc across um, various nations. Um, also, and I think you might have, for, for, for some of the New Zealand based audience seen this, while food service was shut down, there was a pent up demand. So once, um, especially in China, people were talking about it and missing their favorite dishes. Um, but once food service returned, we could see people discussing, you know, the excitement about going to their favorite food service, um, complaining about having to queue eight hours for the hot pot, um, which, which is one of the dishes that a lot of people missed out on um, because they were locked down over winter. Uh, but also this sort of um, wider obligation to support food service when it um, when it returned and people were aware that um, that people were suffering financially that these restaurants had to, had to shut down and weren't making any money over the period and um, wanting to get back out and support them so again it was quite um, quite interesting and, and, a, and a really useful way to track what the sentiment was and also reflects some similar to what we've seen in New Zealand once we started opening back up um, I think people, while they've enjoyed their time at home, a lot, a lot of people are pretty keen to get back out and also realise that if they want to maintain the food service um, options available to them, it's a bit of user to lose it. So you need to get back out there and um, get out and have a burger to support the economy. Um, one of the interesting points that we saw also was um, how we were seen. So one of the things that we're particularly interested in, part of our um, our raising debt for the market development team is, is understanding origin and the meaning of origin to support our taste pure nature brand. And I think um, what's quite heartening and, and quite a positive, if there's any positives to come out of this, is that um, New Zealand was seen to do quite well in terms of our response to COVID and our response to, um, to looking after the country and looking after people. And it hasn't gone unnoticed in, in our export markets, I think. So here's a quote from people talking about actually, actually seeing some of um, the action on the ground and how, how we've been performing. Um, and it's also done good things in terms of how we, our reputation for looking after people, our reputation for reliability. Um, and, and I think increasingly people are looking at that in our overseas markets and when they're making decisions about what, what origin product they're choosing. Um, conversely, and I don't want to dwell on it, but sort of other countries certainly didn't do as well both in terms of their, their response in their country and some of the rhetoric that they directed towards China in terms of um, their attributing blame to, to, the, um, to COVID. So I think New Zealand's come out quite well and, and I think um, there is an opportunity to, to leverage some of the good performance of, of our country in dealing with this and, and how we talk about ourselves and our origin products. Um, other things that are clearly here to stay um, from from what we've seen in terms of people talking about it, I think. So I'm certainly certainly not saying that um, online wasn't wasn't massive before COVID, but it's really put it on steroids. So we've seen um, a huge amount of um, obviously there's a huge huge amount of growth, but from some of the tracking and monitoring we're doing, people have had a generally really positive experience. Um, consumer behaviour in China especially around meat was to really heavily interrogate any product and want to see it physically and 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 touch and feel and, and look at it um and while I, while there's still a lot of um, concerns about food safety and food provenance uh online as a channel has become a lot more um comfortable for especially chinese consumers but more widely in the us and and, and this will continue to grow over time so this we feel this is going to be one of those kind of sticky trends that will continue into the future um also you know, food safety and and traceability is is going to be continue to be massive. I think um, quite quite apart from you know the origins of COVID being potentially related to food and and, and food preparation and 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 some of the where, where food comes from. Um, people are, people and and what they talk about online and and talk about uh, in terms of the context of food is is this safe, where's this come from, and wanting more reassurance and kind of fact-based reassurance about where the food comes from and, and can they trace it back to source. Um, before I hand it over to Sam, we did pull out some of these um, some of these trends actually at the end of last year of that um, were gonna be really important for the red meat sector generally. So um, looking at transparency and traceability and, and, and making sure that um, we can't rest on our laurels in terms of our, our food safety and our, and our food standards. We know we've got a good reputation, but, but um, guaranteeing this and verifying this is going to be increasingly important. And also 
Um, embracing VUCA, which is about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Um, again, this is this things like COVID and 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 um, and things of this ilk are not not aberrations. They're going to be linked into the future, um, and partly due to things like climate change, but but more polarity in trade systems and 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 just general volatility. So thinking about how we plan for that, design systems and processes that, that um, are based with that kind of future in mind would be really important. So I'll hand over to Sam and happy to take any questions. Just before you, just before you yeah, pop off, sure. yeah. So if yep. you had three core things that, you know, all the research you've been doing around consumers, sorry, mm -hmm. bit of a crack question, but, you know, three things if you absolutely wanted, I guess, producers to know in New Zealand, anyone in the, in the, red meat supply chain you know what are the three things we really need to understand has changed oh yeah so i think um so this traceability and and, and transparency it's not new and, and and people have been talking about blockchain solutions um for, for a number of years now but i think this is really it's it's going to be very serious and i think uh we, we i think there needs to be some kind of hope ideally set to wide um uh, kind of consistency around how we approach this, um, because it, it's going to be a kind of table stakes price of entry, in certainly in markets like China, but I wouldn't be surprised in other markets as as well. Um, I mean, again, online is it feels like it's a fairly obvious one, but again, um, I was looking at some some charts around growth in online, and actually prior to COVID, a lot of US shoppers weren't using online, but there's been a kind of absolute reversal, and uh, people grocery shopping online. And the, and the general comfort and experience um, with people shopping online um, is just going to go grow and just aligning our, our, our processes and our systems to meeting that need and, and, and thinking online and pe potentially um, building platforms in other markets or supporting platforms in other markets um, which, which allow our products to be online ready will be will be key as well. And a third, I think, you know, the, the, other, the, the embracing view, it's a difficult one, this, but but I guess it's um, it's planning for that, you know, the, in, the, the volatility that's here, um, the, the volatility that's going to be driven by things like climate change. Um, and I think it's partly about, it, it's assuming that disasters are going to happen and how do we come back from it? I think that's the big one. Rather than, you know, designing designing with other things in mind, I think we've got to, we've got to be designing for things like COVID to be more, more common. Um, yeah. And, and thinking how how do we yeah how do we design systems and processes that have that as the kind of new normal yeah and I guess the beauty of those three things they actually sit together don't they they're not mutually exclusive so you know traceability needs to be digital we can't expect a form to be filled out and that's enough um, it has to yeah. be verifiable traceability um, that online ties into that and then if we can actually nail those things it helps you when you have when you get blindsided <laughs> yeah I was just rereading my report and I said in 2019 climate change will be driving more bio events um, nationally. So it's not uh, internationally, so it's not exactly, I didn't, I didn't predict COVID, but there was, I think there was, you know, even, even there, all of signs are pointing to things are gonna happen, um, whether it be human, human health or animal health related, they're just gonna be happening more often. So yeah, I think, I think that's true. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Sam, I'll hand over to you. And we're doing something novel where two people are in a room. Hi everyone, I'll just get uh, Hugh's face. <laughs> um, it's it's sort of interesting um, that we end on on Buka with with Hugh's presentation because um, one of the, one of the things that we are trying to be prepared for as Beef and Lamb New Zealand or as a sector is is those things that are coming ahead. Um, and to give you an example of that, you know, three probably four years ago now we did the alternative protein study, and, and so. What that allowed us to do is develop a strategy as an industry to, to combat various scenarios around that. And, and it really reinforced um, taste for your nature. Um, Hugh, in terms of his market intelligence role, is just kicking, about to kick off another project now of looking at regenerative agriculture, but actually looking at it through the lens of the consumer. Because actually, at the end of the day, we can do a whole lot of things here, but um, if the consumer doesn't recognize it or, or value it, um, then we might be just be building costs into our business. Listen, what I wanted to do is, is probably um, fan out a little bit again, um, but but really uh, take that, that VUCA on and, and look at what is happening globally at the moment um, and how we're responding uh, to it, and probably what are our big five that are sitting on our plate right now. Um, if we talk about New, New Zealand, 
Um, we expect to play a key role in New Zealand's COVID um, recovery. I guess what I just wanted to remind you of here is, um, I guess, just the, the importance that we currently have and, and then talk about some of the opportunities uh, that we do have. So for the red meat sector, we're the largest manufacturing sector, we're the second largest exporter. Uh, we support 92,000 jobs, which is about 5% of employment. Uh, we have 12 billion of, of value added. We export to 100 countries, 120 countries around the world. And I think it was in March this year, we had our first month of a billion dollars of exports. And I guess, um, as I look back over time, uh, we've we've just um, been quietly achieved. <coughs> Excuse me. So since 1990, we've actually um, doubled our our export values from from about three and a half billion through to seven billion. So I guess in that regard, um, we're a significant player uh, in New Zealand. But with that, we see that we have a significant um, responsibility. Uh, to contribute as well. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of the exports as we go through. Um, one of the things, uh, Hugh reinforced uh, the, the aspect of uh, where New Zealand's brand is internationally. Uh, he, he emphasised the, uh, the importance of origin, uh, of provenance, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and there's no doubt that uh, what's going, going on globally at the, at the moment is really reinforced um, I guess the work that we've been doing, but um, I guess it puts the opportunity on steroids to a certain extent, because if we talk about what people are now looking for, you know, there's no doubt the integrity and provenance and safety of food uh, has been given uh, increased emphasis. And so, you know, the aspects of our Taste Pure Nature brand, which is around the light touch, the harmony with nature, the grass fed, the hormone free, the antibiotic free, all of those things now uh, are being reinforced along with I guess people viewing um, what I would describe as natural food um, a bit differently. As we've seen through COVID, actually natural food consumption has is, is, um, had quite a significant uh, boost. So I guess for us, we just see that that opportunity um, continues. Uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is what Tourism New Zealand um, is doing in terms of you know, the challenge that they have with grappling with how do they keep brand New Zealand out there globally at a time when actually we can't have a tourist in here unless they're willing to sit in a, in a hotel in Timaru for two weeks before they go anywhere. Um, and so what Tourism New Zealand is looking at, and we're getting right behind this, is actually positioning uh, New Zealand, uh, our brand in terms of food. And I think this is just a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for the whole food sector um, to again, take a leadership role um, internationally. Listen, the other thing that we have seen uh, during COVID is, um, I guess, a change in view on either side on, on how urban communities and farming communities um, see each other. And I think um, it's been really great. Certainly, there's been an urban recognition that, uh, that food is important, um, that exports play an important role in this, and, and to a certain extent, the primary industry has kept the wheels moving, especially at a time when we've lost tourism. You know, we've lost uh, international education to a certain extent and, and things like forestry um, took a real hiding. I, I think at the same time though, and, and I believe this really did need to happen, is that farmer empathy uh, of, of looking outside their farm gate and seeing how the rest of New Zealand is fearing um, has been really good as well. I mean, let's face it, New Zealand is a, is a small country with 500,000 um, businesses and we know that uh, businesses that are based uh, urbanly are, are going to go through some real challenges. So I think the empathy of farmers uh, for others that actually farmers aren't always the ones who have it hard has, has been really healthy. And I guess as an industry, it's seen the, the things like um, meet the need um, spring up. And I, and I guess that is a really good um, indication of uh, action following rhetoric. And, and there's certainly an opportunity for us to build that social license um, over the next, uh, I guess, months and years. And, and what we do know is that urban New Zealanders, um, they do think uh, the agricultural sector is, is actually pretty good. Our, our research with Colmar Brunton tells us that 90% of New Zealanders like the red meat sector, 10% um, don't. And I think if all of you looked in your own families, you can probably find 10% of people that don't actually like 
you and your own family. So, you know, we shouldn't get too upset about um, that stat. So we're doing an issue. Well. Sam, I'd probably just add to that is, um, you know, through the COVID lockdown, farmers were desperate to try and get food to people who needed it. You know, yeah. they were they were looking for any avenue that they could to get their food because um, people felt very, you know, you could tell farmers were feeling very conscious of um, that people didn't have food and we were growing it and how do we get that food to those who really need it? So I think that was yeah. a, um, you know, just demonstrated how much farmers actually do want to be part of New Zealand and part of a solution for New Zealand. Yeah, listen, I, I mean, if we if we talk about farmer pride and reputation, um, you know, it's almost number one for, for farmers is, is uh, this this feeling that they're actually contributing to New Zealand and, and just have a bit of respect um, for doing that. So I think that's grown, but but I think what we see is a real opportunity to increase um, that engagement and that mutual understanding and indeed working together around the things that are important. So for us, driving the Open Farm Day, you know, we'll continue on with that momentum, but the opportunity for urban communities and rural communities to work together around um, some of these environmental issues is, uh, is a fantastic one as well. Um, you'll be well aware that uh, trade is um, quite important to us. And, and New Zealand, in fact, is the most exposed country in the world under trade. Nobody um, exports as much as, as, um, as we do. Um, why is trade important? And listen, we think uh, one of the aspects that we need to educate the wider New Zealand more on is, is just the part that exports play in our economy. What do we know about exports is that um, those countries that have a high amount of exports uh, have a high correlation with higher economic growth. We know that exporters employ more people and we know that exporters pay um, better wages. And so therefore, um, the aspect of uh, export uh, or the export economy driving our, our um, I guess, our, our growth out of COVID is, is really, really important. For us, we export 85% of our uh, beef and over 93% of our sheep meat. So, you know, we are really exposed to, to export. And I guess the, the illustration that you have there on screen um, sort of suggests that, um, you know, the global trade um, scene at the moment is just looking pretty pretty untidy. So we, we know that we've had the, the battles between the US and China. Um, they do have a deal now, but how that deal plays out uh, will disrupt things. We know that for New Zealand, um, the Brexit deal is, is disrupting things currently, but then we have the opportunities around uh, free trade agreements with the EU and with, and with the UK. Um, we also know, and Hugh alluded to it a bit, is that through this COVID situation, um, global logistics have been thrown into a bit of disarray. And I think I heard at some point half a million containers in the wrong location around the world. And, and so our ability to service uh, customers and consumers and also our competitors' ability uh, to service them you know, has been significantly challenged. And therefore, um, coming back to Hugh's role again is having that global intelligence is about what's uh, happening and, and being agile to respond to it um, is really important. And I think one of the things I've been particularly proud of over the last uh, five or six months really has been the agility of our industry in terms of responding to change. So Hugh alluded to what happened in China, and China was um, severely logistically challenged for probably uh, the first two months after COVID, but our, um, our, uh, our industries were able to, I guess, to, to deploy other markets, divert product to other markets um, really successfully. And the fact that we export to 120 markets uh, globally, the, the fact that we've been working on that for 100 years um, has stood us in good stead, but we really do need to keep our foot on the accelerator there, and, and that's what we really challenge um, government with. Um, and all of these things, um, environment, uh, environment touches everything, really. And, and so for us, uh, as an organisation and as an industry, um, our determination is to continue to stay ahead of the game. So we launched our environment strategy in 2017. And you can see there it's around cl uh, cleaner water, around thriving biodiversity, around healthy productive soils, and around carbon neutral uh, by 2050. If you look at if you look at our carbon status, um, Haywaka Ekanoa uh, is the industry collective around uh, addressing that and, and really taking control of it ourselves. 
as a sector, we've reduced our um, emissions by 32% since 1990, and, and so we're on track um, to hit that target. If we talk about biodiversity, um, we've got 2.8 million hectares of indigenous species and 1.4 million hectares of native bush, and so we're almost the biggest holder of biodiversity outside uh, government-owned uh, assets. We, we have a particular focus on farm planning, as the government does as well, and, and I guess from an industry perspective, um, listen, we're trying to put farmers in the driving seat so that um, they have a good plan that helps them to build a better business. Secondly, uh, they can use that to, um, to I guess, uh, capture that, that social license. Thirdly, to be able to meet regulatory requirements. And fourthly, to be able to provide uh, consumers and customers uh, what they want. So a focus for us is very much on having a one-stop uh, shop uh, for farmers. Um, lastly, is, is really looking at um, the opportunity that um, COVID-19, I guess, has uh, raised uh, in terms of just understanding the, the importance of biosecurity for New Zealand. Um, you would have seen in the latest um, KPMG um, report that biosecurity has come out as, as number one again. And I guess for me, um, I think that's a pretty accurate assessment. Um, but I think for us, um, I guess we've seen in the last couple of months a real vulnerability uh, to New Zealand around biosecurity issues, uh, whether that's the way that it's hit uh, education or tourism. Um, we saw that forestry sort of exports got cut in half overnight before they had a chance to branch out and do any other opportunities. Um, it has shown that actually as a nation we're really vulnerable. And I guess if you think about what we've been through over the last few years, we've been through some significant biosecurity challenges, whether that's carry dieback, uh, whether it's PSA, whether it's MBOVIS that we're dealing with now, and obviously lastly, COVID. So I guess um, my real call to, to New Zealand um, is that as 5 million and as a leadership role that we play in the industry, but also calling out to government as well, is that absolutely we should not waste a crisis around um, biosecurity. Hugh alluded to the fact that actually we were predicting that these things were going to happen. We know that with the movement of people and animals and products internationally, we are going to get more of these things. And so therefore, uh, firstly around um, intelligence, but secondly, around how we prepare and, and respond for them is going to be really important. So for me, um, that is a really important priority that we need to take advantage of um, right now. So what does that mean um, for us in our sector? Um, I see that where we sit at the moment is that we have a tremendous of, uh, window of opportunity. And I guess it's, it's a window that sits here with quite a few risks and, and VUCA is, is really real. And it's, and it's probably uh, just business as usual now, VUCA, I have to say. Um, get used to it because that's what we've got to deal with. But there's significant rewards as well. And I guess from a beef and lamb perspective, you know, our vision is profitable farmers, thriving farming communities, uh, valued by all New Zealanders. Our purpose, insights and actions driving uh, tangible impact for farmers. Um, we've, we've got a total uh, focus on that for our, for our sector, the work that Q does in terms of really gaining the insight, the deep understanding of the people and the issues that sit ahead of us. Um, it's about um, taking action. We do have to be agile. Um, we have to know that we're making a difference, um, but it is too around the fact that we do need to prioritise because we can't do everything. And um, we damn well need to work together within the sector. Um, but for us, um, working together across the sectors is a really important um, thing as well. It is about telling our story with, with volume, and I, and I sort of think of the, the example of finding five million ambassadors um, to talk about red meat uh, domestically um, and internationally. We do re relentlessly need to pursue uh, new markets and new routes um, to market. We have to underpin our, our offer with environmental integrity. And actually, you know, if we look at that last biosecurity one, we, we determinedly need to, to, to protect our backbone industries um, with top-notch uh, world-leading biosecurity. So that's me. Happy to take uh, questions, or well, both of us are, really. Yeah. So, um, Sam, you talked about tourism, and I love the concept of, you know, if people can't travel here, we can kind of send a bit of New Zealand to them. Um, 
you know, what more do you think we need to do in that space? Or is there any more that we need to do to kind of really power charge that? Yeah, I, I think, listen, um, you know, at, at Beacon Land New Zealand, we've, we've developed a, a brand and a story around um, Taste Pure Nature. Listen, if we look across a number of other industries, we, we have high congruity around the stories that we're telling, right? So, so I think there is a challenge always to tell our own story and tell our own product, but there are some obvious ways in which we can work together. And I think that the Tourism New Zealand one is a good opportunity to pull industry together and, and really amplify um, what our stories are. I think for us, you know, we, we do a lot of joint market intelligence now uh, with companies. We're starting to look at how we do uh, joint market intelligence uh, with other industries as well. I, I use the story that often, um, you know, we might be heading into uh, a customer in the US and we pass somebody from Zespri on the way, somebody else from Fonterra and somebody else from the wine industry. And at times you go, well, we probably could just ask the, you know, five questions from, from one person and, and, and maybe uh, learn together uh, and feed off each other and rationalise some of the resources that we use at times. So I think there's those sort of two opportunities, really. Can I jump in there as well? I mean, I think, and not wanting to bang on too much about our futures work, but um, we did talk in there about exporting a, a food story and and also there's exemplar nations who do it really well. You know, there's the old, I mean, there's ones with a kind of couple thousand years of, um, of food culture like the Italians and, and they have things like Italy, which are little Italian pockets that they, they set up internationally. But countries like Korea, who come out of um, out of relatively uh, less well-known, but, you know, have got a really strong food culture that they export and, and they use it to sell other things. They use it to sell their electronics and, and, and things like that. So I think we can, I think we just need to be a bit more strategic about it and, and stick this working together. So I think this, this work that we're doing with Tourism New Zealand is a really good opportunity to just do something a little bit more strategic and, and, and work together and amplify um, all, all that's good about our food story. Yeah. I guess with such a small country too, um, there's not much point in us all going off on our own tangent. You know, the more we can integrate the themes of what we do, the more power we'll have um, collectively going out to the world, um, building this cuisine destination, building us as a cuisine destination, even though, um, in reality, um, you know, people can't come to us. As I said, we can send that destination to them. Um, I, I think too, Julia, when we when we look across what many industries are doing, um, actually we, we're seeking to sell to the same customer or the same consumer a lot of the time. So for us, um, we talk about the conscious foodie, right? Which is somebody somebody who's relatively well off, uh, really interested in their food and the provenance and the story that sits behind their food. Now. Um, you could pro probably talk to half a dozen other people on the call today and they would say, listen, we're broadly focusing on the same person. Um, so, so there is the ability to have a collective voice. Awesome. Hey, look, I've got a couple of other questions that are, are in line with that. Um, one of them is, um, do you see growth and in, in positive future prospects for dairy and beef integration? Yeah, that's, yeah that, that is a really good question. Um, you know, for us, um, again, it's, it's about... Uh, we look at how can we be most effective as an organisation, how can we be most effective as an industry and, and efficient at the same time. So, so for us, um, Dairy NZ and ourselves um, have a very strong relationship. I sort of went through our portfolio the other day and there's probably 70% of the work um, that we do, we do together, whether that's at the farming leaders level, whether it's Haywaka Ekana, whether it's our partnership with government and M Bovis. Um, sitting across policy, trade, R&D and training, we do a lot of stuff um, together. If you talk about, you know, the physical stuff around the animals, um, you know, bobby calves is, is one of those issues um, that, that have been raised, whether it's from an ethical perspective or a waste perspective or an adding value perspective. And, and an example of that, we've just signed an agreement with um, LIC uh, just in the last couple of weeks. And that's really around how can we jointly find the best genetics out of the beef industry to put across our dairy animals so that we can actually extract a calf that is a, a, a really attractive uh, item for beef finishers to use. So I think there is there is tremendous opportunity. I mean, we're joined at the hip, whether that's around uh, the fact that we're together in rural communities, uh, whether we 
uh, graze young dairy animals or we graze uh, cows during the winter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the industries are absolutely intimately um, linked with each other. Cool. Well, that leads nicely onto this next question is what do you think is the size of the herd improvement opportunity for New Zealand growing beef given the success of New Zealand dairy genetics? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a um, that's a that's a really good point. Um, I, I think um, we we see it as a pretty good op opportunity actually, which is why we're um, we've got an application into uh, SFFF uh, NPI's SFFF fund at the moment, which is essentially uh, to to grow a better genetic <coughs> engine for the New Zealand beef industry. Essentially, to date, uh, we've been using uh, offshore. Uh, providers that don't necessarily have the same focus as us around efficiency of our beef herd and and also um, also grass fed um, focus. So we see there is tremendous opportunity. There just hasn't been enough um, genetic progress uh, through the last twenty or thirty years in our beef industry, and in particular uh, focused on efficiency, but also on the customer at the same time. But obviously, we see a tremendous opportunity. Uh, for the fact that you know dairy cows have a calf, right? And 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 so to put the right genetics into the dairy industry for those animals that they don't want as replacements um, is a tremendous opportunity for both sectors and and the beef industry. Awesome. And reputation, social license feeds into um, the holistic okay. value. Yep. Hey, um, now one. This is probably a bit of a personal question from me. Um, well, not personal question, but a question from me. Um. You know, one of the things the agribusiness agenda brought up was the fact versus fiction, you know, and, um, and you know, I had to laugh the other day that there's another report out saying, why don't we eat a balanced diet rather than less red meat? And, you know, what, what, you know, what a novel, what a novel thought. But, you know, how do we, um, as an industry, work to support our consumer not getting completely confused? And that's probably for you, Hugh, but then also helping our producers not feel um, somewhat confused themselves as to what they should be doing. Well, yeah, I, 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 let me start off with it. But I think um, getting getting some of our health claims and credentials backed up by by hard science, I think, is uh, is part of that. I think it, it's, it's there's lots of things in that, and, and and also getting getting better generally at talking, at communicating our story. And uh, but but I think part part of the work that I'm doing is I'm across um, a project which is looking at. The benefits of pasture-raised beef, for example, and and there is also a proposal to extend that to lamb as well, and just getting some, just making sure that that we have all of the facts to back up why we believe this is a better product and and, and has has better health benefits than, than some other other products, including some of the alternative proteins. So I think, you know, getting getting some of those fundamentals in place is is pretty key, but um, you know, and I think the other point, I guess is just around telling our story better and i think um i haven't been at beef and lamb that long but i've been you know i think we from what i've seen and, and i think our, our our communications team is doing a really good job of, of, of telling our story but it's got to be ongoing and it's got to you know we've got to um you know fund it and keep it at a level uh to to, to combat what is a fairly consistent um sort of counter narrative to that globally so you know yeah Getting, out, getting the facts straight and then telling our story, I think. I think yeah. the other thing I'd add, Julia, is, um, and this is a bit of a cliche, but sort of deep insight, right? So so the first insight is anticipating what are the issues that are going to come up in the next five years that we're going to be questioned on, right? And, and, and so all of the questions that have been asked at the moment, um, we could see all of those coming. And, and so for me, um, part of it has been prepared um, and, and Hugh's talked about the, the research there. So doing the hard yards before you know you're going to need it. I think the second thing, Julia, I would say is just deep engagement with your customers, right, and, and consumers. And, and so you've got to understand where they're coming from, uh, what their fears are, and actually um, who they trust in, in terms of the message. And, and, and I know that, um, listen, if Sam gets on screen and talks about the goodness of red meat, um, immediately, there's a whole lot of people out there who are sceptical, right? Because I'm paid by farmers and, and the industry to say it. But but finding those independent voices that other people trust um, is really important um, as well. 
And, and was that a big driver? I mean, I loved your reports that you've recently, you know, I thought that was fantastic, you know, literally pointing out the numbers. This is what the contribution is to New Zealand. This is what consumers are saying. And, and your manifesto, you know, um, showed a great deal of passion and progressive thinking to actually support five years, not one season. Yeah, I, th I think, Julia, too, you know, we've always got to be prepared to ask ourselves the questions, right? Um, if somebody else is asking the question, we, we've we've got to take a long, hard look at ourselves in the mirror and go, well, is that is that a legitimate question to ask? Um, and, and if there is some to it, then we've got to go away and think about how we run our industry. Awesome, awesome. And now, what would be your? We'll, we'll sort of start to wind it up, but what would be your? I guess any thoughts that you want to leave people with around the market or red meat or whatever, what what, are you, what would you be your key things you'd want people to walk away with? Well, I, I've got to say, I mean, this is our time, right? Um, if, if, you look at, if you look at the fundamentals internationally and everybody sort of knows these stats, we need to double protein production up by 2050. Um, you know, we are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Um, we are really good at this stuff and, and the way that we produce and farm in New Zealand um, is being sought after more and more by consumers internationally who have the ability um, to pay for it. So, so I think for us, it's doing our core really well. Um, it's continuing to, to look forward and, and to listen and to be agile too in the way that, um, that we go about it. I mean, for me too, I mean, I'm, uh, I see a tremendous opportunity to have those 5 million uh, ambassadors. And, and, and so for us as an organisation and as an industry, um, it's engaging with the New Zealand public, helping them to understand them, getting their feedback, and then actually working with them uh, to develop, I guess, to go from what I think is a really good industry up to a really great industry that not only we are proud of, those of us in the industry, but that all New Zealanders um, are proud of. Awesome. Hugh, any Hi. last thoughts? <laughs> no, how, how did you talk about that? She just works for me. <laughs> yeah. now, I was thinking uh, just, you know, and, and I think what Sam was saying is just being a little, a, a lot more, a lot more, yeah, I think good to great, but I think being a bit more strategic about things and working, I think the sector's being a lot more collaborative that I've seen in my time here. So working collaboratively with the sector as our sector, but also with other sectors within New Zealand and just, you know, having, have, being a bit more strategic about how we present ourselves globally uh, and and some of the work that we, we hope to do with the tourism in New Zealand, I think will be a really good test case for that and how that could, could work. But yeah, really being, thinking a bit more and being and, and on, on how we present ourselves and, and, and being a bit more strategic about it. And I think, you know, there's really great opportunities for us in the future. Look, um, from my perspective, I think I've seen beef and lamb um, obviously always supportive, but the progressive thinking, the awesome work that's coming out, the, um, it's something for all of New Zealand to be proud of and something for all of New Zealand to be able to use, whether you're in the red meat industry or not, to really understand um, you know, the perspectives back to New Zealand, uh, as well as... Um, I guess how we can support our communities. And I just, I wanna thank you um, because I think what you've done is brave and courageous and probably not always been popular, but um, you know, the road, what I think I heard a saying once was um, the easy road leads nowhere worth going. And I think, um, you know, what you're doing is, is really supportive of the industry. So we will wrap it up there, but I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you so much for your time today. And I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks for the opportunity, Julia. Yeah, cheers, Julia. See you later. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks.